what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about, about the book, but really talk about what we're all here for, which is what has gone wrong? <laughs> Where did this decision from Citizens United come from? How did corporations get the same rights as, as we the people for whom the Constitution is not written for us, but in effect by us with, with a, a originally and in an ongoing process of amendments, which, which I will come to at the end, about what we can do, what we must do, really, as citizens uh, to save our country, to save government of, for, and by the people. Um, in my view, and, and the view of many others, and, and I'm sure many of you here, uh, because we've worked with many of you here and know that that's the case, that is really what's at stake here. It's not an exaggeration. It's not a, a um, you know, alarmist proposition. It is true, as it has been true in other times in American history, that we face a moment where we are being tested. Um, just as the uh, generation before the Civil War in 1856 when the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case said that African Americans, and this shamefully is in the Supreme Court reporters, you can go and read it, the Dred Scott case, Chief Justice Taney, who, who wrote that the African American has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. Um, that was a declaration of fact in some ways, of the reality in 1856, but it was an out loud, in your face proposition about what America was about, what we the people were about, and we had to face a choice. Is that really who we are? And we said no. We said no, that's not who we are. We had a bloody civil war, unfortunately, but we also had three constitutional amendments to fix that, to say, to rededicate ourselves to the proposition that we're all created equal and the government up for and by the people can work. And we had it again. Uh, you know, we forget that, we, that our current Gilded Age is in some ways, it's a new variation of it, but in some ways it's a replay of the corporate powered Gilded Age of the end of the um, 1800s and the turn of the, the turn of the last century when we had powerful railroad corporations, the powerful monopolies and corporate trusts that were overwhelming democracy. The law that the court struck down in Citizens United, the McCain-Feingold law that banned corporate spending in periods before federal elections, actually has its roots in the Tillman Act, 1907, which banned corporate contributions in federal elections. Theodore Roosevelt, pr Republican president, fought hard for that and won that. That was part of the response to the last Gilded Age. And again, the Supreme Court made a proposition right in the face of Americans. Corporations are persons under the Due Process Clause and Equal Protection Clause. The famous Santa Clara cases, the, the cases brought by the corporate lawyers at that time, um, after the Supreme Court had said you know, remember the Equal Protection Clause after the Civil War in the 14th Amendment, it says that the equal protection of the laws is guaranteed to all persons. Um, the due process and life, liberty, uh, and property are guaranteed to all persons. Women said, yes, finally, we get the right to vote. Equality for all persons, right? The Supreme Court said no. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Minor uh, that women were not, in effect, persons under that clause, do not have a right to vote. Again, right in our face, took a 19th Amendment to overturn that. So then this corporate power at the last Gilded Age comes up and you know, says corporations are persons under the due process clause. They were striking down child labor laws. They were striking down workplace you know, duration of hours in the workplace. Again, used a, a politicized court that, that served corporate power rather than people power to strike down public interest laws, and it took a progressive movement, not progressive as we think of it today as sort of the left part of the spectrum, but progressive of Republicans like Theodore Roosevelt, Democrats like Woodrow Wilson, you know, socialists and populists and every sort of uh, political viewpoint coming together to say we're tested, you know, we, we can accept this or, and, and watch our country go down, you know, watch this beautiful idea of, you know, free and equal people governing in a republic, um, you know, something that is always precarious in this world. Uh, or we could change, we could push, we could work for constitutional amendments, for reform, and they did. They worked, they did four amendments in the space of 10 years in the progressive era. Four constitutional amendments. Um, now one of them was kind of dumb, the prohibition amendment. Uh, they, they, they got a little bit of that righteous zeal and got carried away. Um, but the other three were really good. The, those constitutional amendments are how we got the 
uh, women the right to vote in, in, at that time. We got senators elected directly by the people rather than appointed in money-filled, smoke-filled back rooms of state legislatures. Um, that wasn't how it used to be. That was a constitutional amendment. And we overcame the Supreme Court, struck down the con Congress's uh, um, enacting of a progressive federal income tax. So that they were trying to push back against this gilded age of power and, and, and the very rich, a plutocracy. One of the things they did was enact a federal progressive income tax, struck down by the Supreme Court and Pollock. Uh, constitutional amendment, the people get the last word, overruled the Supreme Court. One of those, one of those uh, three critical amendments in the progressive era and said, yes, we can actually have a progressive income tax. So we are going to propose, we are already leading, we are working together and we are winning the People's Rights Amendment to overrule Citizens United and I'll talk about why that's so necessary. But when people tell you, oh no, don't, it's too hard, we don't do amendments, won't work, <laughs> you know, imagine being the folks who had to pass the income tax constitutional amendments. <laughs> you know, this one ought to be easy compared to that. So it is one of those times though where we are asked if we mean it as Americans. Do we mean it? Are we really a setting out down this wild road of free, equal people governing ourselves in a republic, a, a free, peaceful, prosperous republic. That's the challenge. Um, and so why is that at stake now? Well, directly, most directly, it's Citizens United that ruled corporations are the same as people, struck down the laws that regulated, tried to regulate corporate money in elections. It's why we're seeing the corporate money and combined with you know, another line of Supreme Court cases that say we the people don't have the right to regulate money in elections. Um, it's why we're seeing the super PACs driving so much money into our election. And it's why we're seeing the transformation of, of citizens, of, you know, sturdy American citizens into, at best, you know, unhappy consumers or spectators of a show where we're supposed to go out and then push the button after the, the show is over. That It's a show that's funded by the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest slice of Americans, even when it's individual contributions, like Sheldon Adelson's um, funding of the super PACs to the tune of at least 10 million. He says he'll spend 100 million if necessary. Um, and it's, it's the corporations funding these super PACs where we're not even able to know because there's no disclosure requirement. So that's the immediate threat um, in my view, and the view of John Boniface, who I'll point out here, executive director and co-founder of Free Speech for People, in the view of so many in here I know, um, Citizens United is also an opportunity because it is, it is like those other cases I mentioned. The Supreme Court said out loud a reality in our country right now, corporations, we can't touch them. They spend their money in our elections and there's nothing you can do about it. That's what the Supreme Court said to us in Citizens United. And like those other times, we have a choice. We can say okay and meekly go home or tweak a little bit and hope it's okay, or we can use this as the opportunity that it is as the defining issue of our time and, and, and remake and renew democracy like in those previous times. And the reason we have to is because it wasn't just a bad day on the court. It wasn't just a mistake. It was, as my book describes, and as Professor Stevelman alluded to, the end game of a 30-year process. Uh, you know, I call it the victory dance. Or for, for football fans, the spike in the end zone. You know, the, the big display of, yeah, we won. And, and the, when it started was in reaction to democracy actually working. We forget how robust and vibrant American democracy was even in our lifetimes, you know, say 1970. I, I like to look at 1970. It was messy sometimes. It was, you know, we had all kinds of problems as, as we always will and always have. But there were, there's a connection between the levers of what, what people do in democracies, uh, you know, organize, march, write letters, uh, you know, call your representatives, um, and what the government did. You know, and so April 1970, 20 million Americans came out into the streets on Earth Day, the first Earth Day. Remember, rivers were catching on fire. Oil was spewing off the Santa Barbara oil spill. Um, we, air, you couldn't breathe, and kids and, and elderly were dying because of the toxicity of the air. 
Um, we had had a century of corporations externalizing the poisons, the toxics, without limit, without regulation, and keeping the profits. And 20 million Americans came out in the street on that Earth Day to say, we can't keep doing this. It, we, this will not work. It won't work for democracy. It won't work for the Earth. It won't work for life. It won't work for a fair, competitive economy with corporations that don't externalize poisons. Um, and they demanded change. And the change that was happened very fast was amazing. With, with Richard Nixon in the White House, right, a Republican in the White House, Congress that was hardly, you know, one way or the other in, in, in any kind of extreme, they certainly weren't the green Congress. Um, within months after that, we had the EPA created, and then in a couple of short years, the EPA created a Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Toxic Substances Act, Superfund begun, Eastern Mountain Wilderness Act. I could go on. A very long list of essentially a remaking of the deal, you know, that, that corporations have their place in the economic sphere, but there's public accountability. It's no longer a free ride. You can't just externalize and spew the poisons. We have to have a balance. And there was, uh, you know, it worked very well for a, a, a period of time. It still works in some instances as well, although it's under attack now. Um, but it actually it made remarkable progress. But on that day, that 1970 time period, um, I tell the story in the book of Lewis Powell. Um, he was a Virginia lawyer at the time, a corporate lawyer, uh, Richmond, Virginia. He was on the board of the cigarette company, uh, Philip Morris. Um, he was on the board of a dozen other corporations. He was an advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He looked at that display of, you know, democracy and organizing and responsive government with a bit of horror. And he wrote a memo to the chamber, um, a detailed memo. Some of you may know it, the Powell memo, the chamber called it. Uh, and it outlined a game plan. It outlined, it said corporations have to organize. They have to fund a multi-year campaign. They can't do it one corporation at a time. They need to work together. They need to use their advantages as big, powerful, um, you know, moneyed corporations, put some of that money together to affect public policy, to change, he said, to change the legal, economic, and social structure of America. And he even referred to the best vehicle for that, he said, his words, an activist-minded Supreme Court. So within six months, Richard Nixon appointed Lewis Powell to the Supreme Court. And did we have a debate about whether we should go down that road of a radical corporatist agenda that he had laid out for the U.S. Chamber? No, he sailed through 98 to nothing, or one, I think. There. And the, part of the reason was nobody knew about that plan. Uh, the, the memo was not released to the Judiciary Committee. He was never asked about it. The Chamber kept it secret. It was intended to be secret. It, it leaked out several years later, but at the time of his nomination, there was no debate because nobody knew about it except the Chamber and Lewis Powell and some corporatist allies. And they executed that game plan. The Chamber started, in response to that memo, the National Chamber Litigation Center, which is still uh, has grown more aggressive in each year, bringing litigation, claiming corporate rights, striking down our laws. Washington Legal Foundation, Pacific Legal Foundation, New England Legal Foundation, wherever you live in the country, you have something called the whatever in your region legal foundation, corporate rights advocates. Um, and they went to work. The, and Lewis Powell um, on the Supreme Court wrote the key decisions. So. They started bringing litigation. The first one was in my home state, Massachusetts, where they challenged a citizen referenda law that said, if the citizens of Massachusetts are doing a ballot initiative that has nothing to do with corporations, no corporate money. Perfectly reasonable, right? The ballot initiative at the time, a little bit of um, you know, uh, coincidence of history, progressive income tax, whether Massachusetts should have a progressive income tax. Gillette, Bank Boston, and Digital Equipment Corporation got together as, as the game plan suggested, funded litigation. The, Was the New England Legal Foundation weighed in. All the foundations came to say, corporations are persons with rights. This, pre this prevents corporations from exercising speech rights if they can't spend the money in the citizen referenda to defeat that progressive income tax. They said, corporate voices must be free. Um, corporations are people. Uh, over and over again, this was repeated. And the Supreme Court of Massachusetts 
followed 200 years of American history and essentially said, please, don't be ridiculous, and they lost. They went up to the Supreme Court of the United States and they won five to four. Lewis Powell wrote the decision um, that struck down that law. It was the first time in American history that an election law, a ballot law that limited corporate spending had ever been struck down. They went on um, a similar game plan um, a, 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 uh, to attack environmental laws. So we had the um, New York law that tried to get utility corporations to stop promoting energy consumption when we had an energy conservation policy of the state. They wanted to um, encourage energy consumption for shareholder profit, even though it was against every common sense or, and law of New York. They said that law violates their corporate speech rights, and they won. Lewis Powell wrote the decision. Um, Lewis Powell wrote four key decisions, creating something that had never existed in constitutional law in America, corporate speech and corporate speakers, corporate voices um, that we're not allowed to prevent from speaking. That means spending tons of money or executing business plans and corporate plans that go against the public interest. He, he created a majority for that point of view. William Rehnquist was appointed the same day as, as Lewis Powell. You know, and the irony here is in, in law schools and um, the, the, the law generally, Lewis, Lewis Powell is considered a moderate. Um, people didn't really think of him as this radical corporatist that he is, was, he's passed away now. Um, and he was considered a moderate, and he was on some social issues, some, um, you know, uh, racial issues, some of the um, cases the court dealt with that didn't involve corporations. Uh, but he's considered the moderate, and William Rehnquist was con kind of considered, oh, that, you know, extreme conservative. Rehnquist had a tougher time at his nomination because he was well known as a conservative. Um, Rehnquist dissented in every one of those cases I mentioned. He was writing passionate dissents about what Republican democracy, small r, was all about and the dangers if you, le if you allow corporations to leverage the advantages they get from the state that we the people allow for reasons of economic policy, limited liability, perpetual life, advantages of, of, of corporations so that they do serve the public and help. Uh, that was the idea that they'll serve a public interest. Um, so they got advantages. William Rehnquist warned the dangers of, of that economic might and power being leveraged into corrupt political power. He said that's why Massachusetts should be, of course, free to regulate corporate spending. In the, in the utility corporation cases he talked about, he said um, you know, that, the, that the decisions about well, how we're going to regulate corporations um, are really up to those who owe their lives and souls to something higher than the state, <laughs> is how he put it, which meant, of course, corporations are creations of the state, um, that they're not rights holders under the Constitution, they're not people. Um, but he lost that struggle. Lewis Powell won. We've had laws struck down across the board, um, environmental laws, public interest laws, you know, tobacco laws. Uh, one example, and then I'm gonna, if you're suitably depressed, tell you why there's great reason for hope and great um, work to do together. So just one last example, Monsanto. Okay, Monsanto, which has moved from Agent Orange and DDT to deciding they ought to be making food, has, is using genetically modified technologies, as you may know. One of their drugs they developed was called RBST. Uh, it's genetically modified bovine growth hormone. You inject it into cow's blood, and it forces the cows to produce milk far beyond what they were ca they're capable of by nature. Um, that makes them sick. So you inject them with lots of antibiotics, and then you move the milk in massive amounts now, factory-developed, GMO-developed milk, to market and drive down prices and put out of business, organic farms, dairy, f family farms, and so on. It's, it's got, from every conceivable perspective, social, health, animal welfare, um, you know, who, who should make the rules and decide about big transformations like that of how we produce food. Um, it had every reason to say this is not the road to go down. Every democracy in the world except the United States banned it. It's illegal to use even in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Here Monsanto, like other large corporations, has its way in FDA and, and Washington. It wasn't banned. Um, and so I tell the story of Dexter Randall, a 65-year-old dairy farmer in Vermont, who organized his friends, his, his citizens, fellow citizens, formed rural Vermont to try to 
you know, learn more and then bring you know, what we expect in a democracy, citizen voices to the table. And he went down to FDA with his other you know, fellow farmers. They brought these studies that the other countries had relied on to say no to this. Um, he says they, they wouldn't even look at the studies. They just, you know, they said cows aren't our problem. We're social issues like family farms aren't our problem. Um, and he, you know, he got frustrated, but even when they allowed it, he went back to work. They organized in Vermont. They got the Vermont legislature to pass a law. Um, after great debate, overcoming Monsanto lobbyists, really tough road, but the people wanted the right to know if their dairy products came from cows produced um, with, with the, the milk was produced with this GMO, people said, we, we want to know. We have a right to know. You know don't, if we can't ban it, at least we have a right to know. <laughs> and so Vermont had a law that said but it has to be on the label of milk, ice cream, cheese, whatever. Um, and they had about a day to celebrate before they were sued. Uh, and the lawsuit said that violated corporate speech rights. It violated now, instead of the right to speak, i.e. spend money, um, it violated their right not to speak, they said. They said, we don't want to put that on our label and the government can't force us to. Uh, it violates First Amendment. Um, and they won that case. That law was struck down. And now, here we are, 15 years later, we're still struggling hard to do what probably over 90% of the American people want, which is label GMOs. If it, so we, let us know. We're not, you know. we're not mice in a lab. Let us, let us decide for ourselves. Um, we don't have it yet, and if we try to get it, we're going to run into that corporate speech doctrine. It's the same thing if, you, if you're trying to get environmental progress, you're trying to get a sustainable economy where Main Street actually has a chance, you're trying to get you know, something under control with our budget and our debt and our military structure, our endless wars, you will run into this problem of corporate power. So what can we do about it? We can't fight these one at a time anymore because what has happened is this is a power struggle, a constitutional power struggle about who makes the rules in the country. And we have been put in our face, just like those other cases I mentioned, corporations make the rules in this country. Um, that's what Citizens United says. Corporations will decide who's going what the candidates are going what candidates are going to win. Um, and we can't accept that. And so the way we will change that is to take that great opportunity that, they, that this has been a huge wake-up call to Americans across the country. We have two million people who've signed resolutions for a constitutional amendment. We've had packed rooms like this around the country where people are coming out to join this campaign to do what our grandparents and parents and great-grandparents did when they faced the same kinds of challenges. They overruled the Supreme Court. They pushed back on corporate power. They, they said, no, we are not the kind of people who say African Americans have no rights that the white man is bound to respect. We were given both the power and the duty under Article 5 of the Constitution to say what our Constitution means. To, the founders knew that factions and corporate faction, the founders talked about the dangers of corporations. They knew that, and not, and not just corporations, but all kinds of threats to Republican government and self government of free people. And they made this Article 5 where the people would be able to come together, put aside their political differences to the f deal with fundamental structural reform that was necessary. And that's what Article 5 is about. It takes two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states to ratify it. And that sounds impossible, right? In this kind of Congress, they can't get out of their own way. Um, so how are they going to possibly do that? Let me tell you how they're going to do that. When when we got the, women, the women's right to vote, the 19th Amendment, it was a bunch of male legislatures in Congress who voted two-thirds to pass that out. When we got the Senate to be elected, that amendment, we got a bunch of unelected male senators to vote that one out at about the same time. Um, and they didn't do it because they thought it was a good idea or wanted to give up power. They did it because there was a nationwide movement um, doing everything possible to insist on that proposition of equality and justice and democracy and right and wrong. And so that's what we're doing. We're getting resolutions through states, through towns and cities, Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, Los Angeles, Boston, Oakland, towns and cities in between. Fifteen towns in Massachusetts have passed resolutions, lots of others. There's dozens and dozens where city councils, town meetings, whatever organizing bodies there are in municipalities are passing resolutions condemning Citizens United and the idea of corporate rights in our Constitution rather than people's rights and calling on, demanding that Congress 
send the People's Rights Amendment, the 28th Amendment, to the states for ratification. We are getting state resolutions done, and we're winning them. Everywhere we can put this up for a vote, we have won, and we will keep winning. New Mexico just passed a resolution um, through the House, through the Senate, uh, again, condemning Citizens United, calling on Congress to send an amendment to the states. We're pushing back in the courts. The Montana Supreme Court, as many of you may know, uh, stood up to the Supreme Court of the United States and says, no, we, we in Montana know, we've learned our lesson. Corporations ran our state. The copper barons ran our state. We passed a law. The people, through the ballot initiative, passed a law in 1912 saying corporations can't spend money in Montana elections. Steve Bullock, the attorney general there, went down to Congress and testified after Citizens United came out. He said the people did this after 100 years. I'm not going to be the one to just roll over and let it die. Uh, essentially, he said, sue me. They did. And, and he won. Free speech for people was there. We filed an amicus brief with the American Sustainable Business Council, two Montana businesses, the American Independent Business Alliance, because this is not anti-business, folks. Don't let them tell you that. They'll, they'll say, oh, those, those people are against corporations because they don't like business. We have a thousand business leaders who've signed on to this campaign. You know, we're, we're the business, Citizens United protects the Monsantos, the city groups, the AIGs, the Exxons, the global multinational. David Corton's here. Every time I say multinational, he says, they're not nationals. They're, they're global. They're above nations. And he's right. Um, so I correct myself. These, these, these global <laughs> corporations um, that are bigger than some, a lot of states. That's who benefits from this. Most businesses don't have a million bucks, five million bucks to, to pay, do pay to politicians or do pay to play elections. Most, most businesses need their capital for their business. And so that's why we're getting business support. It's why we're working with Ben and Jerry's and uh, the American Sustainable Business Council on the uh, new campaign just rolled out. It's called getthedoughout.org. And Ben and Jerry's, as you might guess, picked that name. Uh, <laughs> and they are, uh, have an ice cream flavor, the Americone Dream, which you'll be able to see, read more about this campaign if you buy some ice cream. So that's a fun way to save democracy. You get to eat ice cream, too. Um, we have lawyers, attorneys generals, business people, citizens of every walk of life, Republicans, Democrats, everyone's coming together. Uh, we have 79% of the people, according to our Peter Hart research poll, um, support a constitutional amendment to reverse this decision. So we have every opportunity before us to get this done. It won't be easy. It'll be a long road. It'll be a shorter road if you can join us in this work. And we will win it. We must win it. It's, it's the, the, the question before us is really, if we don't, you know, shame on us because other people before us were able to overcome equally significant challenges to do what was necessary to save our country. So with that, I'd ask you to join us. I look forward to further conversation with Enrique. I hope I didn't use too much of my time. Um, and I look forward to conversation with all of you. And I look forward to working with all of you to win this great struggle for our country. Thank you. That was, that was spectacular. Thank you so much. I think for some of us new here, we may think, well, if this is all true, how is it that I, that I couldn't have heard this before? How is it that I couldn't have heard all of these pieces put together before? Is it that this is an exaggeration? And I, I wanted to express why, uh, why that's true, why that could be true. I think most of us know when we reflect upon it that the media is currently driven by business interests. That's obviously one important factor why we don't hear this message enunciated at greater volume. A second reason is that academics are largely confined to their individual subject areas. Constitutional law professors don't speak to environmental law professors in important ways, nor do they speak to labor law professors, nor do they speak to business law professors. Each of us write with increasing depth in our own narrow subject areas, and we leave it to journalists who we poo-poo as being generalists to put all the pieces together so that we could really see what's going on. Corporate law academics over the last 20 years have focused on the issue of shareholder primacy and putting together elaborate event studies based on algorithms demonstrating the importance of stock price movements. All of this comes together so that we find ourselves very far down the road of corporate 
co-optation of the public discourse. Thank you again, Jeff Clements. I turn the program over to Enrique, to Serena, to lead the rest of our program for tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, President Obama, uh, I, I consider it throwing in the towel, capitulating to the reality that we're seeing uh, in this election, which is, um, you know, you're nobody if you don't have a billionaire and a super PAC. Um, and Obama, President Obama doesn't want to be nobody. Um, I think actually, you know, somebody with a bully pulpit, as Theodore Roosevelt used to call it, of the presidency, um, you know, he had an opportunity for leadership and to talk about why. It's, it's, it's wrong, you know, it's, it's corrupt. It's, and, and, and he didn't do that, and that's unfortunate. Um, I, have, I, I think highly of, of the president, but I, I wish he had been a little bit more, uh, you know, determined to take this fight, uh, even um, to challenge the use of super PACs and, and corporate funding. And instead, it now is something everybody does. And that's part of what the problem has been, is that we begin to accept there must, it must be OK, because why else? with the Supreme Court bless it, the President's blessed it, everybody seems to bless it, you know, how bad could it be? Um, but I give the President credit, he did make it known uh, when he made that decision that he doesn't, isn't happy about it, that he doesn't want to unilaterally disarm, if you will, and that he would support a constitutional amendment, if necessary, to overturn Citizens United. I give him credit for speaking out at the State of the Union to sound the alarm for the country, um, remember Samuel Alito saying, no, 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 it's not that bad. <laughs> and, and, and the president saying, yes, it is that bad. And that was good. Um, but, you know, I hope this will be the last corrupt uh, election that we have to witness this kind of thing. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, the president isn't just using a super PAC. He's talking about having cabinet officers go out and, you know, encourage donations to a super PAC, things like that. And I. And I think it's, it, it saddens me, as I think it saddens a lot of Americans. I don't necessarily blame him personally. I understand the political decision of it. But it's one more reason to either um, get incredibly depressed or incredibly motivated to say, we are demeaning ourselves. You know, we, are, we are humiliating ourselves, and we have to change this. So I hope after this election, we can move forward to do that. Let's talk about Montana uh, and the uh the Supreme Court there ruling, and, and actually the U.S. Supreme Court then staying the Montana ruling. Uh, but then two Supreme Court members recently came out, um, Justice uh, Ginsburg and Breyer, saying that the court should, it's reason for them to maybe review all of this. Do you think that's a long shot? I, I think it's a long shot, but um, it's not, but, but it's a very important shot that we took. And, you know, I think, uh, it's why Attorney General Bullock wasn't going to roll over and wanted to litigate that case. It's why we went there to do the amicus brief, uh, because we wanted to force the question back to the Supreme Court, hopefully to have them see what was actually happening out here in reality, uh, not in the Citizens United um, fantasy. Let me say why I say fantasy, if I could, is that you know, the Citizens United case turned on essentially three things that aren't true, beyond the fact that corporations aren't people. Uh, Justice Kennedy says, oh, we don't have to worry about foreign money, because I'm not, you know, the court wasn't saying that, it's a, it, that there's anything unconstitutional about keeping foreign money out of elections. Well, of course, corporate money, it doesn't know country. You know, News Corporation is a big player in this. They gave a, th a million dollars at least to the Chamber of Commerce in 2010 to run, to, you know, to help fund their massive uh, election fund. The, the number two shareholder of the News Corporation is the Kingdom Holding Company of Saudi Arabia. Two billion dollars in shares. So, you know, it's a fantasy if you're thinking that these global corporations whose shareholders are global corporations, uh, you know, are just going to be able to, you know, we're going to be able to manage that money. The other thing was that shareholders will be able to control it, which we see is not true, and that we'll have disclosure, which we don't. So the Montana case, after two years, was able to go back to the court and say, look, everything you thought was true is not true. We're, getting, we're seeing our democracy fall apart out here. Take another look at it. And we're delighted to see the extraordinary, really, statement that you mentioned, Enrique, of Justice Ginsburg. It was a stay decision, which is usually just a one line. 
you know, stay granted. That means just hold the case that Montana Supreme Court's dramatic refutation of Citizens United has to be on ice until the Supreme Court gets a chance to rule. And so it's just a stay. It just means, you know, hold, hold the phone, let's have an appeal here. Um, they almost never write. I've never, I've never seen a decision where they, a stay, where they actually went out of the way to say a statement about what the court ought to do. Justice Ginsburg wrote that given the reality of what's actually happening in Montana and the rest of the country, the underlying assumption in Citizens United that corporate spending will not corrupt or have an appearance of corruption uh, can no longer be sustained and that we should re-examine and reconsider Citizens United. Now, unfortunately, the reason I say it's a long shot, Justice Breyer joined her. That's two justices. Um, it takes five to decide a case in the Supreme Court, and there's no indication that the five um, who were in the majority in Citizens United are reconsidering. Uh, but nevertheless, that's why we, we have to do the amendment campaign, the resolutions. We have to push back in the courts. If they wish to say it again, even though in spite and say we don't care about the facts, um, we're still doing this. It will drive this country even harder to do the right thing and overturn it with a constitutional amendment. If they overturn it themselves right now, that would be a good thing too. Uh, but I think it's, you know, the betting among those who follow the Supreme Court is that they, they will not, um, not overturn Citizens United, but rather overturn the Montana decision. Let's talk about this process of uh, uh, people's rights amendments. Um, it, it's not going to be something you would do overnight, obviously. Uh, and I take it that in traveling around the country to uh, make these presentations and to give people a history, that this is what's really important to get people to understand what that's all about. Yeah, um, no, it sure won't happen <laughs> overnight. Um, and um, it, the history is important. I think, you know, people. It helps, I think. Uh, you'll have to tell me after reading the book if it helps, but I think it helps to know, understand where this came from so that we, once we have identified the problem right, we can work on the solution. Um, now, some amendments have gone through in months. Uh, you know, the, um, the amendment on, um, to lower the voting age to 18 took a matter of months. The effort to win women the right to vote took uh, about six decades. So uh, we're hoping for, to be closer to the earlier one, we think we will be. We don't see polarization on this issue. Um, we see Americans of every political persuasion coming together on this. Um, so, and, and we're seeing every day in the election just a reiteration of the problem. Uh, so we're, we're very hopeful. And given the dramatic, you know, I was here in Seattle, what, a year ago or so, um, and just the, progress we've made since then is, is quite remarkable. Um, so I, I think uh, we may be surprised. If we get behind this effort, we push on this door, we may find the door opening and we're going through to a whole new sort of political environment where a lot of reform and this amendment can actually get done. So the question yeah. was um, um, that, um, how do, where do we draw the line with some entities, uh, political parties, not-for-profit groups, things like that, where we want to empower uh, activity, um, speech, you know, advocacy, whatever, and, and how do we make sure that this you know, amendment campaign doesn't, um, if, I, if I, I'm paraphrasing the question, so just wave your hand if I'm off base, but you know, doesn't um, do unintended damage to that kind of uh, um, thing that we want. And the short answer is we draw the line where the, we the people have always drawn the line in the Constitution. Um, we make very clear in the People's Rights Amendment that this does not affect the rights of people, plural, including association rights, including rights of when we come together as a group to advocate for anything, whether it's political party, union, business even. You don't need a corporate charter. You don't need a government permission. You don't need a you know, limited liability or tax deductible right. Those are privileges that we the people decide upon. Um, and if you don't like the rules, you don't have to use that particular entity. So, um, you know, a, a, a labor union or a business has a choice when they're organizing. Do they want to use a corporate entity? You look at the law and decide pros and cons and decide whether you're going to. So 
what this would do, and I should say, I was going to say on the freespeechforpeople.org, we have a resources <laughs> tab. You can go down, and we have frequently asked questions, and this, there's one, uh, this is one of them, um, and, and lots of others with more detailed answers. But the short answer is the People's Rights Amendment restores the idea that the rights are for people, whether in groups or otherwise, and that anything where you're getting a government advantage, the people make the rules in our state laws about that advantage. So, it, you know, that's why we have laws that say 501c3s, corporations that have tax deductibility, like not-for-profits. Um, those are, it's sort of a question of who decides. It's not, it's not the five people on the Supreme Court who just lay down the law. It's we, the people, decide about, you know, the benefits and burdens of a, of a corporation, whether not-for-profit or otherwise. Um, and if you don't like the, how that comes out, then everybody's free to associate and not use those vehicles. I don't think that's going to be necessary. You know, I think we all have reasons why we want effective corporate vehicles, and that's true in business, too. You know, that part of this is to say, restore the responsibility and the power of us to get effective corporate entities, to make the rules so that we have corporations that actually serve and benefit society and our economy. And that's true of not-for-profits and other groups as well. Um, it's a little long-winded, but there's <laughs> download the, the uh, frequently asked questions on freespeechforpeople.org as well. Um, He's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some idea of your strategy for reaching out to the right-wing populace who have a lot of the libertarian red that yes. some overlap, but man, they're psychotic. How do you get them? <laughs> How do you get them to be rational and, and move with us in that direction? Well, no offense, but we don't start with calling them psychotic. People <laughs> <laughs> here who don't know I have trouble. No, we uh, just a little different. You, <laughs> you should hear what they call us, right? <laughs> so part of it is to to move beyond the fights we're having on some of the smaller issues, you know? and they're not necessarily smaller issues. I shouldn't say I don't mean to demean any of the issues. There's some big issues that we're not in agreement on, but I think we're all in agreement that we want America and democracy to succeed. So we're doing very specific things. First, we did that poll I mentioned. It wasn't. It was a reputable heart research. Associates doesn't just tell you what you want to hear. They, they actually look for what are Americans thinking. They work for Wall Street Journal, NBC News, whatever. And they actually do the focus groups. They really try to tease out what are people thinking. And so they, they found for us that 68% of the Republicans and the conservatives support this constitutional amendment. Um, and so part of it is to not blow that, <laughs> you know, to keep this broad coalition together. So it's why we're focused on states like Montana, New Mexico. Um, we have Massachusetts coming, but we need wins in geographically and demographically dispersed states. Um, we are working uh, with the transpartisan group and libertarians like Michael Osterlink, uh, who's a, a libertarian in Washington, to do outreach, because sometimes it's the messenger. You know, it's not just the message but they need a trusted voice from their, you know, libertari another libertarian to talk about it. Um, and and, and he has worked with us to, to do outreach to the libertarian community. We've had sort of salons, debates with, um, uh, with, with, with representatives of libertarians and conservatives where we've had good open conversation. Um, you know, Bruce Fine, Reagan administration, Justice Department official, uh, didn't come into that kind of discussion on our side. Um, and I'm not sure he left it exactly on our side, but he came to the view that corporate, he said, you're right, corporations are government created entities. I'm a libertarian, what am I, what am I thinking? Corporations should have power. But he decided we should abolish the use of any corporations at all, period. <laughs> so you never know where these conversations are gonna end up. Um, but, but we think that if we just continue to um, do as we have done, which is to truly be nonpartisan to resist the temptation for short-term political gain uh, because frankly the energy is a lot more energy on this on the left than on the right at the moment um, and that's not to say that there's not significant support for this on the right it's just not maybe their number one issue because there's some, I, th I shouldn't speak for that calculation but I think you know just as President Obama made a calculation about the super PAC there's a calculation on the other side about the short-term advantage of significant corporate money. 
And, um, you know, hopefully again, after the election, there'll be more opportunities to look a little more broadly. Um, so that's, all being said, it's not easy, but we are making progress with that. Hi there. I, I want to thank you for everything that you've said and been trying to do. Um, it occurred to me as you were speaking, um, bribery. Um, most people find, most reasonable people find bribery repugnant from a moral, ethical standpoint. So my question to you, perhaps more philosophical, is what does a political contribution constitute bribery? Yeah, Thanks. you know, it, it, it's a great question. Under the, uh, there's a strict legal definition, and then I think there's the definition that most Americans use, which is what's happening right now is, is bribery. I mean, uh, how, how can there not be a connection uh, between these massive amounts of money going to a, a political campaign and the product that comes out that actually provides great advantage to those who fund the campaign? Um, there is a senator in Washington who I uh, appeared with recently, I probably shouldn't say who, because he says, uh, he reported publicly, I guess, so maybe I could say it, <laughs> Sheldon Whitehouse, senator from Rhode Island. Um, in fact, you can see it on C-SPAN. Uh, he said that they will come into his office, uh, and it's not just the bribery, quid pro quo, we'll pay you if you do this. It's the threat and the coercion that says, we will fund your opponent if you don't do this. And so he says, they'll come into the office and show, you know, say, we're a little troubled, you're not with us on this, on this one. Uh, you know, we just want to show you a campaign ad we're thinking of, and it'll show an attack and, and say, we've got five million behind this in the next election. Um, you sure you don't want to reconsider your position on that? Um, and it's just extraordinary what passes for political activity that doesn't land people in jail right now. You've got Jack Abramoff. Remember Jack Abramoff? Yeah. So he went to jail. It wasn't for his legalized bribery of, 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 of lobbying. It was for ripping off his lobbying clients, the Indian tribes. Uh, but now that he's out of jail, he's going around saying what I was doing was bribery. And, and that's what the lobbyists are doing. It's legalized bribery. And so, you know, the number, t I have three reforms in the book. The People's Rights Amendment, number two is I call clean the swamp. We can make laws against that once we have the power to make effective laws again and, and, and call it for what it is, the bribery for what it is, the corruption, and, and ban that kind of activity. And then the third one is the corporate charter reform, that we need to remake these. You know, right now, most of the rules for corporations that come out of Delaware, a state of 900,000 people, um, making the rules for the biggest global corporations on the planet. You know, there's 310 million Americans who have some, not to mention the six plus billion uh, people in the world who are affected by this, who ought to have a say in, in how we're making these corporate entities. So that one is right up there in terms of something we need to fix. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, David Clark, the author of the Corporation Rule of the World. I've obviously read quite a few books on corporations, and I just want to say in this public forum that your book, Corporations Are Not People, is the most important and the best book on corporations I've read. And I strongly urge everybody to get a copy, read it, and give it to your friends. <laughs> Oh, don't, don't go on now. <laughs> don't ruin the moment. <laughs> you know, I'm one of these naive Americans that grew up thinking that the Supreme Court was comprised of intelligent uh, people who were concerned about facts and the law. And it's quite disillusioning to find that that's really not the case. Um, and particularly with Lewis Powell and uh, uh, our uh, good friend John Roberts. These were two justices who were clearly placed on the court under false pretenses, who came with agendas that have nothing to do with the law or with fact. Now, what can we do about the process of su selecting Supreme Court justices to avoid this problem? Well, um, first, David, thank you very much for your, your kind comments. Um, David Corton wrote the books on corporations, so um, you know to, to receive that uh, uh, 
praise from him is an honor uh, bigger than I can say. So thank you very much. Um, the um, question about the Supreme Court is a, is, is a very difficult one. I mean, in part, it's, I think, um, still true. Despite all, I have respect for that institution. I do think, by and large, they try to do their best. I think they do have different ideologies, they have different backgrounds, and I'm afraid it has become m much more politicized than it should, the Supreme Court right now. I'm not sure, I think we've had other periods in American history where that's the case. Um, and so I think in part that is, um, you know, like Citizens United, a bit of a wake-up call that we have to pay attention to things um, like corporate law, <laughs> Supreme Court nominations, or, and lower court nominations that maybe we didn't think we had to pay attention to. And I think part of it, and part of this work on the amendment campaign is actually to carry this conversation and debate around the country so that when we're having judicial nominations, those judges are asked, you know, do you think corporations have the same rights as people? What do you think of the Lewis Powell chamber plan? You know, we need to air this in public so it becomes part of the debate. Uh, because I think, you know, nobody asked Justice Chief Justice Roberts when he was being nominated, you know, what, you know, you might get the Citizens United case. What, what do you think of this, uh, this corporate rights effort? Um, now, he probably wouldn't have answered. They've all learned how not to answer the question. Um, but it needs to be a part of the debate. Um, I think we need to recognize that, uh, you know, sometimes that's the way it is. Uh, and um, we have to use the tools that are given us. And that means pushing back, that they're not gods who lay down the, the law on high for us. They, lay, they, they decide cases. Um, Article 5 gives us the final word on the constitutional amendment process to rule what actually the Constitution means. You don't do it every time. You don't pick a fight with the Supreme Court every time. But it's a very important check. Um, they had to do it in the New Deal. Without an amendment, remember FDR's court packing plan, that was pushback against a corporate court that was striking down the New Deal in a political, political kind of way. And they didn't get the court packing plan through, but that kind of pushback, that kind of national debate about, you know, what is the role of the Supreme Court? One of the Supreme Court judges switched their vote, and the New Deal was possible. Um, so it is partly not bad that it's a political thing. They're not totally insulated from what the country thinks. And that's why it's very important to, to raise a fuss um, when they go so far off track, uh, because they're not, um, you know, totally ivory tower isolated. Um, I do still think they're worthy of respect, and when we respectfully disagree, we overrule them with a people's rights amendment. So, so that question was about strategy, uh, both what is our strategy, but um, initially, what strategy do we expect from the other side? You know, what are the, the corporations aren't just going to say, okay, we'll change it. You know, what, what, when, what do we expect to come from corporations to defeat this effort, and what are we going to do about that, right? Um, so uh, he, here's the thing. Right now, we don't know, because um, it's, it's quite remarkable, in some ways heartening, that there aren't good arguments being raised on the other side. I mean, even Citizens United, it, it's an it's a incredibly weak written decision. Um, you can read it as many times as you want. You won't see a definition of corporation. Um, you'll hear about voices and speakers and all, you know, disadvantaged class of person, that's what they call it. <laughs> so, so they have to do better than they did in Citizens United if they want to convince the American people that, um, you know, that's the route we ought to go. Uh, I'm not sure they can do better, honestly. Uh, you know, we've tested some of the to the arguments on the other side with, um, we're doing a ballot initiative with Common Cause in, in Montana uh, to um, you know, state that the policy of the people of Montana is corporations are not people, money is not speech, the, um, you know, the Citizens United needs to be overturned, and con Congress should send an amendment to the states for ratification. Um, and so we've tested some of these uh, arguments that might come on the other side. And, People are, you know, Americans get it. We know what's happening and we know, you know, we know when advertisements and campaigns are corporate funded uh, and, you know, you can attack a negative, you can, you can blow someone out of the water in politics by, you know, scandal and saying what they used to think and making them look awful. 
it's harder to do that with an idea. You know, it's harder to do that with an idea that the American people, we know in our hearts is true. Um, but I think they'll do things like say, this is anti-business. You know, this is gonna, this is gonna, you're gonna kill the economy. We need jobs. What are you, you're attacking the job creators, right? So we've heard all those. Um, that's why we have a thousand business leaders ready to stand up and say, no, you're, you're killing the jobs. You're making my business harder. You're, you're doing crony capitalism that favors you know, non-American global corporations at the expense of, of we small businesses that make most of the jobs. So we are inoculating ourselves in the political jargon uh, by getting the business leaders ready to stand up, by getting you know, Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's and the job creators uh, ready on our side, um, working with the American Sustainable Business Council and so on. Um, we're, get, we're, we, we're getting, you know, I expect we'll get the um, unintended consequences. Fear is a very effective political weapon, and unfortunately it's wielded all the time in this, you know, in our, in our discourse. It's, um, it's fear of terrorism, it's fear of immigrants, it's fear of, you know, the unknown, it's fear of anything. They'll try to make us afraid. And the, the, the fear factor on this one will be unintended consequences, you know, the, 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 the corporate lawyers will say, oh, you know, oh my God, if corporations don't have rights, the government is going to be in your church next before you know it. Um, so, so and, and that's the response we hope for. We'll laugh. <laughs> and we'll laugh because we know that that's not true. Um, so part of it is to line up the, we have, uh, uh, you know, former attorneys generals, you know, great legal pro law professors, like at this school and across the country, ready to, to make the case that no, this is not, there won't be unintended consequences. The unintended consequences is that corporations have constitutional rights. That's not, the, that's the dangerous thing to fear. Um, so, so basically we anticipate these kind of arguments, we get ready for them, and then, you know, we have faith that the American people will be able to make these you know, that we know what's going on and, the, and we'll make the right call, even in the face of much more funding on the other side, much heavier artillery coming at us and these things. And so far, we're winning. I mean, this, we are winning resolutions, we're winning votes, we're forcing votes. Nobody wants to be seen voting against this right now. Um, so, so we're just going to keep on pushing and keep preparing. And if we get a new strategy we hadn't thought of, you know, we hope, you know, we're not the only ones in this. We want everyone in this and we need everybody's help to help combat the kinds of attacks we're going to get. <laughs>